For hot point makes the toughest job around the house of green. Yes, hot point means the best for you appliances and cabinets too. Electric kitchens through and through the work automatically for you. So point, point, hot point for your laundry. Move hot point in and it moves out all wash day grungery. So point, point to hot point as the Nelsons do. You toss your hands up in the air when hot point works for you. Oh, no, I <laughs> just talking to myself. Oh, did you have a nice conversation? Well, <laughs> no, I wasn't exactly talking to myself. I was just trying to figure out a subject for my speech tomorrow. What speech is that? Well, you know, the, the big one at the Chamber of Commerce. Dunkel is the chairman of the committee. Oh, sure, I didn't realize that was tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> the big luncheon. And you mean you haven't even picked out a subject yet? Well, I have a system that never fails. It works for any kind of a speech you want to make. I don't want to make any, thank you. But I must admit you've aroused my curiosity. Uh, well, it's kind of an outline. You see, you use the same beginning regardless of what the topic is. The beginning goes like this. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied, it is a lack of fairness. A good example of this is, and then you see, you insert your topic. For instance, suppose you were discussing Oh, safety on the highways. You'd say, when asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied, it is a lack of fairness. A good example of this is safety on the highways. We can make the highways much safer. We can prevent many accidents if we will pass one law. Make driving illegal for women. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> You see, you get the, the general idea of it. Uh, I mean, you see, if you have a good beginning and a good ending to a speech, then you can sort of flounder around in the, in the middle of it and, and nobody realizes it. <laughs> well, sounds logical. How do you end it? Well, uh, then you see, you work the deal around to where you say, here is the opportunity to correct the problem that you've been discussing. See, that gives you a chance to work in this little uh, joke about opportunity. Would you like to hear it? I probably have. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, it, it, it's kind of an amusing <laughs> little joke. It seems that this night watchman was making his way through the park, and this young couple, this boy and girl, were sitting on the park bench. And the night watchman was carrying this lantern. A lantern? Uh, well, it, it's a, uh, a pretty old joke. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the night watchman comes up to the boy and the girl, and he says, uh, uh, Say, young fella... Uh, are you kissing that girl? <laughs> and the, the, the young boy is kind of scared. He says, uh, no, sir, no, sir. And, and the old guy says, well, here, son, uh, hold my lantern. <laughs> I didn't realize you went to high school that long ago. <laughs> well, it's not a terrific joke, but it, it puts him in a good mood. See, and then from there you say... And here is the opportunity to alleviate whatever the condition is that exists. And you discuss that, and then you go into the finish. For the finish, you recite that immortal poem, Opportunity. Master of human destinies am I. Fame, love, and fortune. That, yes, that I remember. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I did. It, it, it's got a, a stirring finish. I like that old poem. But he who hesitates or doubts is condemned to failure, penury, and woe. Seek me in vain and uselessly implore. I answer not, and I return no more. It is rather overpowering. Yeah, it's one of those things where even though you don't know what the guy's talking about, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does have an important ring to it quite a plan. Yeah, and the beauty of it is it can be used for absolutely any topic. Well, I can see that. Reminds me of a woman who spoke at our club the other day. Somebody say something about a speech? Oh, hi, boys. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, fellas. Hi, Pop. Please don't mention the word speech. I have to make one in English class tomorrow. So what? What do you mean, so what? I'd like to see you do it. That's how much you know, wise guy. So happens I'm making a very important speech. Now, isn't that something? 
Oh, it's really nothing. You're not kidding. It'll be nothing if you give it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Before you guys run out of breath, I think you should both know that you're not the only ones going to make a speech around here. Your father's going to be the main speaker of the Chamber of Commerce luncheon tomorrow afternoon. Oh, how about that? Yeah, for some reason, they selected your old man. <laughs> well, are you going to make a political speech, Bob? Oh, well, uh, I'm not sure. Not necessarily. I haven't decided yet. Well, I'm making a political speech. Oh, good for you. Uh, what office is your man running for? He's going to be our next president. Say, this sounds interesting. Could we have his name? Sure. Iggy Magoo. <laughs> Iggy for president? Sure. You'll be the best president in our home will ever had. He has to get elected first. He can't lose. I'm handling the champagne. <laughs> he means campaign. I mean champagne. We're serving ginger ale right after the speech. <laughs> you guys sound like you're doing this in big style. Oh, sure. Just like the politicians. We're even going around kissing all the babes. <laughs> Babies. Who's running this show anyway? <laughs> there doesn't seem to be much doubt about it. Our platform is no homework. You ought to have a campaign slogan. You know, like Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. Oh, we have all that stuff. Well, what's your slogan? Iggy Magoo and Loverboy, too. <laughs> Loverboy? Who's Loverboy? Please, no embarrassing questions. <laughs> that the confidence seems to run in the family. Your father hasn't even decided on a subject for his speech tomorrow. Aren't you nervous, Pa? Oh, uh, not especially, David. I'm not too worried about it. How come? Well, I've got a little gimmick that makes it easy. You mean you give away stuff? No, no, uh, nothing like that. So I was just telling your mother before, uh, back in high school, our English teacher taught us sort of an outline that works for just about any speech you want to make. Is it hard to learn? No, in fact, it's very easy. You see, you begin every speech the same way. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied, it is a lack of thoroughness. A good example of this is traffic accidents on the highway. Look out now. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever subject you may choose. That sounds neat, Pop. Then you finally work the conversation around to opportunity, then you tell a little joke. How do you work it around to opportunity? Uh, well, uh, you do it very subtly, of course. For instance, you could say, and speaking of opportunity, and then you go on to say that this is the opportunity to correct whatever situation you're discussing. That sounds neat, Pa. Anyway, and then you say, and what is opportunity? Master of human destinies am I. That's fine, dear. <laughs> It's a, a very fine old poem. It has a, a wonderfully strong finish, too. Seek me in vain and uselessly implore. I answer not, and I return no more. Vote for Iggy Magoo! <laughs> when asked what is the greatest fault of the American people... When asked, what is the greatest fault of the American people? When asked, what is the greatest fault of the American people? Hi, Oz. Oh, oh, hi, Thorny. Hey, what's this I hear about you're going to make a speech? Oh, it, it's really nothing. It's going to give a little talk over the Chamber of Commerce. You know that big special luncheon they're having? Yeah. I'm going to be the chief speaker. Oh, that's a shame. Can't you get out of it? What do you mean, get out of it? Well, you know, you can tell him something. Uh, tell him you lost your voice. Oh, no, Thorny. I want to make the speech. You want to make it? Well, of course. Well, in that case, tell him the truth. Tell him you snapped your cap. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, uh, now you're not really serious about this thing. Well, I am, too. <laughs> okay, i uh, suit yourself. But you couldn't get me to stand up in front of that bunch for one million dollars. I've seen some pretty big men lay some awfully big eggs at those luncheons. <laughs> oh, Thorny, don't be silly. Okay, Oz. But when you're up there shaking like a leaf, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> There's nothing to be nervous about, Thorny. They're all good friends. Uh-huh. Well, Herb Dunkel didn't look nervous either. 
till he poured himself a glass of water, then almost drowned himself trying to drink out of the pitcher. <laughs> He must have it was good for a big laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the day Joe Randolph made the speech? Yeah. Uh, his knees were knocking so loud, I got up three times to answer the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, believe me, Oz. If I were you, I'd try to duck this thing. Well, what about the guy last week? He was very well received from what they tell me. Well, sure. As a matter of fact, he was terrific. Weren't you there? No, no, I, I couldn't make it. Oh, sure. But he was a professional speaker. Had a regular set routine and everything. Which is another thing. He's going to be pretty tough to follow. Oh, well, what you don't know, Thorny, is I have sort of a set formula myself. It's been good for years. Really surefire. <laughs> yeah? What's that? Uh, well, it's a set introduction that can be used for any occasion. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied... Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt replied. Oh, Theodore Roosevelt was a great guy in his time, but this group is modern, up to date. Well, Thorny, I told you before, I've used this routine successfully for many years. Oh, please, you're going to be speaking to intelligent people. Now, you can't use some corny high school routine. Oh, it's corny now, is it? Oh, now, wait a minute, Oz, don't get excited. I'm only trying to tell you this for your own good. Well, please don't trouble yourself. Okay, okay, I'm sorry I mentioned it. You're just jealous because you aren't selected as the main speaker. Oh, sure, that's it exactly. Well, you know darn well I'll go down there and I'll put on a great show for them. I'm sure you'll put on a great show. I'm not the type of guy who quits on a thing like this. I'll make a good speech if it kills me. I'm sure it will. And Oz, I couldn't think of a more horrible way to die. <laughs> well, I think I said about enough for now. But if I think of anything else, I'll give you a call. Don't bother, I might not be home. Now, wait a minute. Yeah, there is one more thing before I leave. Such as what? <laughs> Good luck, guys. My blessings go with you. I've been trying to talk my husband into a food freezer for months. Me too. But a bigger refrigerator is my number one problem, and, well, we just can't afford both. Pardon me, ladies. I couldn't help overhearing. You see, I'm Vern Smith, a hot point salesman, and I think I have just the answer for you. My store is right here at the next stop. Why not take a look? Here's the answer to both your problems, ladies. The hot point superstore. Oh, it's a beauty, but it's just a refrigerator. Oh, no. It's a refrigerator plus a true zero cold freezer. Imagine, you can quick freeze and store up to 88 pounds of food in there. Hmm, that is a big freezer. But what does it do to the refrigerator part? Say, has this ever got a lot of room? Oh, and convenient room, too. Yes, everything in this Hot Point Superstore either rolls out or swings out. This Hot Point Meat Mart. These roller shelves. And these door racks put all the foods right at your fingertips. Big freezer, big refrigerator. Oh, oh, I bet it sure costs a lot. Oh, no. Much less than a separate freezer and refrigerator. Then it must be the Dickens to defrost. Not at all. It defrosts automatically. Mr. Smith, that's for me. Look at this bargain on fresh strawberries. I sure wish we had a freezer to keep them in. Pardon me, madam. Well, you know the story. Well, here's my stop. Be seeing you. And hope you'll be seeing Hunt Point. Last night, while the town slept, there was no sleep for Ozzie Nelson. From the early evening hours to the early morning hours, he worked feverishly on his speech for the Chamber of Commerce luncheon. slips quickly by as Ozzie sits in the den, writing and rewriting. Mr. Chairman and friends. The clock strikes one. But Ozzie's gonna write that speech if it takes him all night. Mr. Chairman and 
fellow citizens. Two o'clock. A lesser man would have given up long ago, but not Ozzie Nelson. He moves into the dining room and tries again. Gentlemen of the Chamber of Commerce. is weak, and so at 4.30, Ozzy, fatigued from his gallant efforts, gropes his way upstairs, and after some tossing and turning, finally falls into a troubled sleep. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied, here you hold the lantern. Well, good morning. Oh, good Hi, morning, Hi. dear. How do you feel? Well, considering the fact that I only had about four hours sleep, I feel pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a little breakfast will help that. Is your speech all set yet, Pa? Well, pretty nearly, David. Not exactly all set, but I have some ideas pretty well lined up. I think I have a pretty good speech for school today. Oh, that's good. Say, would you like me to look it over for you and... Uh... No, never mind. I guess there's nothing there I could copy anyway. I got a couple of jokes you could tell, Pop. Pop's already got a joke to tell. You could tell another one, Canny. What this is it? This is in the form of a question. Did you hear what the skunk said when the wind changed? It all comes back to me now. Okay, okay, quiet, quiet. That's the original joke. Have you got your speech all set, dear? Well, uh, as I was saying to David, it's not exactly set, Harriet, but I have my ideas pretty well formulated. Well, how about that outline your high school teacher taught you? That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, well, I've been thinking that over, Harriet, and after all, these are pretty intelligent men I'm going to be talking to today, and I'm not sure that a corny old high school routine like that would be very effective. Well, it sounded good to me. I thought of a couple of good beginnings last night. One of them just where I fell asleep. Uh, gentlemen, we are here today. We are here today. And gone tomorrow. <laughs> gentlemen, I am here today. To get a free lunch. <laughs> Stop interrupting your father. I don't know, dear. Do you think you ought to tackle this? Well, sure, Harriet. I mean, this thing takes a little time, but it's worthwhile. I'll get my ideas all straightened out in just a minute. What was that other beginning I had? Uh, gentlemen, I am here today to make a speech on why people should never make speeches. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen, I know you're wondering why I'm here today. Come in. Hello, Oz. Oh, hiya, Don. Say, so you're a little early, aren't you? Lunch doesn't start till 12.30. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, sit down. Uh, thank you. I want to speak to you about the luncheon, Oz. Oh, dear, this is terribly embarrassing, too. Well, what's embarrassing? Well, I'm sure you've heard of Lieutenant Colonel Rex Farnsworthy. Well, I, I, I believe so. He, he's in the Army, isn't he? <clears throat> yes, that's the fellow. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, he's uh, passing through town today on his way to Washington. Just returned from a very hush-hush mission overseas. You know, top military secret stuff. He's written a book all about it. <laughs> he sounds like a very important man. Oh, yes, he is. You can imagine what a busy man he must be, too. And you can also imagine what an honor it would be to get a person like Colonel Farnsworthy to speak at the luncheon. Oh, yes, of course. Well, we got him. <laughs> but I thought you said he'd just be in town for today. That's right, Oz. We thought that since the Colonel would only be in town today and since you live here all year... Oh, you mean you'd like to cancel my speech? Oh, certainly not, Oz. Oh, uh, then you mean you, you don't want to cancel my speech? Well, yes, we are, but we won't like it. <laughs> I really feel dreadful about this, Oz. Oh, that's okay, Doc. 
You don't mind? Oh, no, no, no. It's perfectly all right. Well, whatever you say, Oz, I uh, want to apologize again for this last-minute cancellation. Oh, forget about it, Dunk. After all, I'm sure you'll find the Colonel much more interesting. Well, this is very sporting of you, Oz. I just want to say you've been bully about this. Oh, thanks, Dunk. Oh, you've been more than just bully. You've been bully, bully, bully. Oh, that's good. Oh, really, Oz. You're all bully and a bully wide. <laughs> Almost ready. Dinner? Oh, for goodness sakes. Just thought I'd lie down here and rest my eyes for a few minutes. I must have slept most of the afternoon. Well, I thought I'd better wake you up for dinner. Besides, I wanted to tell you about the meeting. Meeting? What meeting? The meeting at the Women's Club. Oh, oh, yes. How did it work out? It couldn't have been better. Now ask me what they decided about the playground. Okay, what did they decide about the playground? They're all for it, but it took a short, impromptu speech by Mrs. Ozzie Nelson to turn the tide. Wait a minute, you made a speech? <laughs> yes, I did. And if I do say so myself, it went over very well. Well, good for you. How about your speech? Oh, well, uh, never mind mine. Tell me more about yours. Well, I began it like this. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt replied... <laughs> You mean you gave my speech? Yes, I did, most of it. I hope you don't mind. No, no, of course not. I'm glad it went over so well. Might be pretty embarrassing if any of the women are married to members of the Chamber of Commerce. Well, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Hi, Mom. Hi, Pa. Oh, hello, David. Hello, David. And how did your speech go in school? Oh, swell. The teacher said it was one of the best she'd ever heard. Why, that's wonderful, oh, David. Oh, good. The joke about the lantern really got a big laugh. Oh, you used my joke? Heck, I used practically your whole speech. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh hello, hi, sir. Sir. Well, you hear what happened? Iggy Magoo won by you, man. He won by you now. He got all the votes. <laughs> well, good for him. Well, that's wonderful, dear. Did you make a good campaign speech? I sure did, boy. When asked what is the greatest fault of the American people, Theodore Roosevelt said, Iggy Magoo for president. <laughs> what Theodore Roosevelt said. So what? Nobody in our class knew him. <laughs> that routine of mine got quite a workout today. Your mother used it and David used it? He did? Yeah, very successfully, I understand. Hey, what's the idea of using my speech, David? Your speech? It's Pop's speech. Say, we all seem to have forgotten about your father. Yeah, how did you do, Pop? I bet you did terrific, boy. I'll bet he did, too. Oh, uh... Well, to tell the truth, uh, I didn't have to give my speech. Why not? Uh, well, uh, Dunk stopped by and explained the whole thing. It seemed the committee decided they'd rather have some colonel give a speech. In fact, he wasn't even a, a colonel, just a, a lieutenant colonel. Well, I think that's awful. Do they know that you stayed up half the night preparing that speech? No, oh, well, after all, Harriet, it's probably just as well. Frankly, I'm just as glad they didn't call me. I was a little relieved to get out of it. Oh, come to think of it, I, I was worked up to just the, the proper pitch. Well, I think it's a shame. Well, dinner's just about ready. Will you boys set the table for me? Sure, Mom. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll help, too. No, relax, dear. I'll call you when dinner's on the table. Oh, okay. Hi, Harriet. Hello, Thorny. Hi, Oz. Oh, hi, Thorny, old boy. Oz, old pal, I want to ask a favor of you. Anything except money. <laughs> I know it's an imposition to ask you to make two speeches in one day. What's this, Thorny? You want me to make a speech? Well, now, look, Oz, if it's going to work any hardships on you, I don't want you to do it. Oh, no, no. I'd be happy to, Thorny. Oh, Oz, that's wonderful of you. Ordinarily, I wouldn't body with this, but it's such a big occasion. You see, it's a dinner speech. No, no, wait a minute. I think I've read about that in the paper. It's a banquet at the Elks Club, isn't it? No, 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 that's another affair. Oh, I know. No, uh, it's that big wing thing they're having over at the men's club. Oh, oh who's no, chairman no. of the committee? Ah, uh, so let me explain it to you, will you? Well, go ahead. 
Now, first, you know Charlie McGillicuddy. Charlie? Oh, that's right. His son is graduating from college at the midterms. Say, Thorny, don't tell me they want me to make the main speech at the graduation exercises. No, 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 Oz. Will you listen a moment? Okay, go ahead. Now, I'm sure you've eaten at Charlie's Diner. Well, certainly I've eaten there lots of times. Well, this is a big night in Charlie's life. He's just added three more stools at the counter and a booth for ladies. <laughs> Tonight at 10 o'clock, is a grand opening. You mean this speech is supposed to be given in Charlie's Diner? That's right. And there'll be free hamburgers in it for both of us. <laughs> Speech. Of course. A lot of people will be eating dinner. After all, it is a diner. I know, Thorny, but this is ridiculous. Oh, now, Oz, I promised Charlie you'd make the speech. Well, you can just tell Charlie that... I mean, of all the silly things, Thorny. After all, making a speech... When asked, what is the greatest fault of the American people... Replied, it is a lack of thirst. Although at first blush it may seem to belie the dictum of this famous statesman, nevertheless our own Charlie McGillicuddy has left no stone unturned, has seized every opportunity to make this delightful little establishment the finest in our community. <laughs> and speaking of opportunity reminds me of a little story you might enjoy. It seems a night watchman was going through the park. Here's the most important air conditioning news of 1954. Brought to you by Hot Point in this new Hot Point push button air conditioner. It has features and extra values that can be demonstrated right before your eyes. But most important, Hot Point has this amazing new electronic filter that does things no other filter can do. It traps over 100% more dirt, dust, and pollen than any other air conditioner made. What's more, this Hot Point electronic filter is permanent, never needs replacing. See a dramatic demonstration of how it keeps summer dust and dirt out of your house now at your Hot Point dealers. For extra values and advanced features that mean more healthful summer comfort for you, get the Hot Point push button air conditioner. <laughs> Think my speech went off okay? No, I think it was wonderful. Oh, gee, thanks. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, it is. Oh, you did? Who's that? And some fellow was at the diner tonight. Oh, thank you very much. Next Saturday afternoon? Oh, sure, yeah, sure. I can make it. Be glad to. Sure. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> well, what was that all about? Uh, he's the man who owns the tidy tidy laundry. Oh? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it seems that they're adding three new wash tubs Saturday, and he wants me to officiate at the launching. <laughs> Next week, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, starring the entire Nelson family, Ozzie, Harriet, David, and Ricky, will be brought to you by Antizyme. Listerine Antizyme toothpaste stops the major cause of tooth decay every minute of every day. Well, good night, folks. We'll see you again next week. Good night. And remember, always look to Hot Point for the finest first. Yes, sir. That's what I always say, boy. What do you always say, little man? Always look to Hot Point. For the finest, first.